Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Cronin. I'm a physical therapist with uh, Memorial Hospital, specializing in uh, vestibular disorders as well as neurologic disorders, that kind of thing. Uh, but the reason I'm here to talk today is because of my hobby. I'm also a ultra runner. Uh, I run marathons and well farther than that. My favorite being the 50 mile. Uh, yeah, I love that reaction. <laughs> um, but because of my school of, because I'm training myself and coaching myself, as well as I'm coaching a couple of friends of mine, as well as I'm the physical therapist friend of a bunch of athletes, as a result, every time somebody gets hurt, they come to me and like free advice kind of thing. So uh, what I'm here today to talk about is the common stuff I see um, with these athletes. Uh, most of these athletes, some are in high school, but all the way up into their 80s. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about not so much uh, the common ways to treat like an IT band tendonitis. I figure if you're treating an IT band tendonitis, you know what to do. I'm, I'm not going to tell you well on that, but I will tell you how they got there, how they developed this overuse injury, and what's a good way to get them on the correct path so they can train to run 100 miles without further injuring themselves. Uh, and this is my son. This has nothing to do with the presentation. I'm just proud of him. He smoked that little kid behind him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, to define endurance athletes, I pretty much go with anything from anything where if you're running as hard as you can, when the gun goes off, if you're running your top sprint speed, you screwed up. Um, these are athletes, any sport that takes a significant amount of time and relies more on oxidative metabolic pathways. Uh, the common description being sprinting is like a wildfire while marathoning is a long, slow burn. Uh, and I include everything on this thing, but just so you know, I am mostly going to talk about runners just because that's partially where my experience is and partially because I get a little passionate about it because I enjoy it so much. In fact, Chris, warn, my boss, warns every student I have not to get me on the subject of running because I will never shut up about running. And y'all gave me 30 minutes to talk about whatever I want, so this should be fun. Uh, includes marathoners, ultra marathoners, triathletes like the Ironman, uh, obstacle course racers, which some of them are up to 10, 15 miles which is a little nuts to me because you're gonna run 10 miles in the mud and then climb a wall. I don't get it, but it, they like it. Uh, soccer players, uh, backcountry hunters, uh, and by that I mean the people who go up like 20 miles into the woods, kill deer and hike it back on their back. Uh, and then hikers, um, including people who are doing everything from like a 10 mile overnight to uh, hiking the Appalachian Trail, the thousand plus mile trail. Um, these are athletes built for the long, slow endurance, and they train a significant amount of uh, slow twitch muscles. These are not the ones that are pushing the red line. These are the ones who are running at a comfortable pace. And I put slow in quotes because my marathon pace is about a nine minute mile. Uh, my ultra marathon pace is about 11 a minute mile, which is actually pretty slow jog, but you got guys like uh, Meb, who's one of the top marathoners in the world, his marathon pace is like a five minute mile. He does 26 of those five minute miles. And then uh, Rob Carr, the best, right now, this year anyway, the best ultra runner uh, in the country, uh, just finished uh, Western States and his average pace was seven minute miles for a hundred miles. Going up the Sierra Nevadas. <laughs> So slow is in quotes. <laughs> uh, question I get most is why? Why? Uh, and I put a couple of quotes because it's not a really good explanation, but I put a couple of quotes here to kind of give you an idea. First one being the trouble is a man can live his entire life without knowing whether or not he's a coward. Uh, you hit that thing where you're done. You're, you still got two miles left and you are about to collapse you keep going, that's kind of an awesome thing. Uh, kind of goes with if we knew all the things we were capable of, we would astonish ourselves. Uh, Dean Carnassus, if you want to run a, run, run a mile. If you want to experience a different life, run a marathon. If you want to talk to God, run an ultra. 
that may be more hallucination, less religious experience. <laughs> Um, my favorite is, uh, it's the only sport where nobody boos, uh, which is cool. Um, there's a tradition in Ironmans who the first place uh, person, man and woman, stay throughout the entire race and give finisher medals to everybody else. They support everybody in the race. And in um, ultra running, there's the, there's the podium. There's, we have four places on ours. We have first, second, and third. And then we have what we call DFL DQ. I had to write it down. Uh, DFL DQ. That's uh, dead frickin' last, didn't quit. <laughs> because if you got your butt whooped by the race, you're gonna still finish somewhere mid-pack. If you're the dead last person, something happened to you including Hard Rock two years ago, the dead last guy got struck by lightning. <laughs> and he kept going. <laughs> now, other than to brag about my sport, the main reason I put this slide up here is if you get these people and you're treating them, these people are nuts, <laughs> including me. These are not people who are gonna just like, well, you broke your leg in seven places. You can't run tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> It'll just hurt, like, no, 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 you can't. they're gonna keep trying to do their sport. They're not gonna quit. These are people with insane uh, pain tolerance. So you're gonna have to really put the brakes on them and that's the kind of mentality you're gonna have to fight a little bit. Um, it's the oldest sport. Another reason I'm bringing this up, it's one, gaining in popularity like crazy. Uh, 2011, one out of every 600 has finished a marathon, uh, as opposed to in the 70s where one in every like 6,000. Uh, over the last 12 years, there's been a 47% increase in the number of marathon finishes, and triathlons are also gaining in popularity. True, most of the 4,000 are sprint triathlons, but still, that is an incredible distance. Uh, and 4.5 million people have participated in an obstacle course race. So this is gaining slowly and steadily in popu uh, popularity. Uh, common myths, it'll kill your knees. I hear that one a lot. Um, you can eat whatever you want, which I don't feel guilty about cookies, I will say that. Uh, all that running can't be good for you, and the first man to ever run a marathon has died, which is Chris's favorite. I'm picking on him a lot. Uh, by the way, some of the slides in here, I put in pictures because they amuse me. They're not in the thing, but it won't change the major message, one of them being this one. Uh, my grandpa says that all that running will ruin your knees. Interesting, how are his knees looking? I don't know, I'm not sure he can see them. <laughs> Research tends to show that endurance running neither increases nor decreases the incidence of joint, knee joint damage. Uh, damage usually comes more from trauma, genetic factors, body type, and your running or walking form. Um, usually, statistically, you're not at a higher risk nor at your lower risk for arthritis. Uh, runners tend to have a better quality of life should damage occur, most probably because they're in better shape as well as they don't stop anyway. They, they, switch sports to something that doesn't aggravate the arthritis like biking or swimming. Uh, and there's a bunch of studies that kind of go with that. Um, you all can read them. <laughs> uh, the, they show that there's uh, less joint pain and less damage, suggesting running may have a protective effect, not a huge one, but a little bit of one. Um, after marathons, there is stress and small tears in the tissue of the knees. However, that remodels very quickly. And um, the slight damage heals quickly and is minimized if the athlete is well trained and the joints are adapted to stress. I like that last one because it does emphasize something that happens a lot with people who train for a marathon and it's just like, well, I run 5Ks, which is about three miles. I'll jump up to the marathon and I'll do that in like, six, eight weeks. That's a hell of a jump and it beats the heck out of your joints. So that, that's the, one of the tra major training areas. Um, the, you could eat whatever you want. Um, not all foods burn the same way and obesity can be maintained if there's no change in a terrible diet. In other words, if you exercise and run a lot but you still eat like crap, you might still have a little gut on you. Mine's mostly beer, but you know. Um, 
And then it's a mentality of eating for fuel instead of dieting. I'm not on a diet, I'm eating the foods that make me run better. Um, just to give you a little, uh, little background on it. And then to throw away the one that the first guy who ran a marathon died, uh, this is mostly for Chris, um, Philadelphus, and anybody who knows Greek knows I just slaughtered that name. Uh, the most accurate historical count is he ran to Sparta, which is about a 150 mile run in two days, came back and then ran to Athens the next day, which is the traditional 25 miles. No wonder he died. <laughs> he should probably have had a sandwich or something. Um, and then also, my personal opinion, Greeks love a good drama, and in dramas they always pretty much kill the heroes, so that may have been what that was about. <laughs> Uh, so the actual meat of the presentation, typical training errors. Uh, here's what most people think a training schedule should look like. You, you run, you run some more, you run another mile to cool down or something, eat a light breakfast, you run again, you stretch, some of them do, um, beer, Try beer again, um, light, a light jog, then you sleep three hours and you're running close so you can get up early and run some more. That's how most people think you should train for this, just run an incredible amount, uh, which is a good way to just kill yourself and get a divorce. Um, here's what an actual training schedule should look like. Um, there's uh, usually do some kind of cross training like the gym or yoga or whatever, a moderate distance some speed work, a recovery day where you just run slow for a small amount of miles, a rest day, and I'll go into detail more about this in a bit, and then um, another moderate run, and then your big mileage run up to 20 miles. To, as you notice, the mileage slowly increases over a course of a few weeks, as opposed to just tack it all on at once. Uh, training rules for it, to kind of get, uh, go in a little more detail, there's the 10% rule that says that weekly mileage should not raise any more by more than 10 percent uh so if you ran i'm not good at math but if you ran 30 mi uh 30 miles last week if you want to increase it you should only increase it by about three miles you do this to slowly let the body acclimate to that joint stress as well as build up strength build up endurance cardiovascular and muscular endurance plus you got to build up some mitochondria too uh, it avoids overtraining and injury, especially stress fractures, and also it's a good way to avoid psyching yourself out. Uh, if your longest run was 10 miles, you should not next week do 20 miles. That'll just scare the hell out of you. But if you only have to run 12 miles, well, it's just two miles more. It's a good way to slowly increase and get comfortable with that. I plan on having such an awesome run that Morgan Freeman should narrate it. I have friends who that's every single training run they do. Every single time they go out as hard as they can for whatever mileage their plan says, which is stupid. Um, it's a good way to get hurt. And it's a good way they've gotten hurt. Um, I have a good friend who developed a tibial stress fracture because of that training philosophy. Uh, only one to two training runs a week should be difficult. And by difficult, I mean raising your heart rate above 80% of age-adjusted max. That's important, the 80%, because uh, there's what's called the black hole of training. Not entirely poor, but a good aside. Um, you, there, there's a little threshold where if you go above 80% of, eight heart, 80 of the heart rate-adjusted max, um, you'll get these benefits of cardiovascular fitness as well as improved mitochondrial density in your muscle cells. Anything below that, it's a good way to get used to training stress, but it won't actually give you those benefits. Uh, the rest, so one to two training runs, there's usually like five to six runs a week. So the rest of them should be at an easy pace. And by easy, I mean, there's that old saying, start easy and then back off. It should be a fairly comfortable run. And a good rule of thumb, if you don't like strapping a heart rate monitor to yourself, is you wanna run at a pace that you can say the entire Pledge of Allegiance without difficulty while you're running. Or if you're me, you just talk a mile a minute to whoever's next to you.
If you can do that comfortably while you're running, you're going at a good, relaxed pace. And that's what most of your runs should look like. Uh, listening to your body. If it hurts, stop. It shouldn't hurt. <laughs> There's a lot of people who run, well, it hurts, so I'm just going to keep running and eventually it'll stop hurting. No, that'll get it worse. Um, that's a mentality that I have had to beat into a lot of people's heads. Uh, you should decrease or drop a training day if your body says you need to. Uh, you should eat foods that make it run easier, make your run easier. Don't eat a bucket load of fried chicken before running the next day. Also, running with a hangover, not fun. I wouldn't know that, but you know, I've heard. <laughs> and if you're really wasted and sluggish, not wait, but you know, sluggish. <laughs> Well, I guess if you're drunk too, but if you're sluggish, switch speed work, those hard runs I mentioned, switch it to another day. You don't have to do it on every Wednesday or whatever. Uh, if it's not happening, don't do it that day because again, you might be stressing a system that already has stresses on it and it could lead to a soft tissue injury. And then rest days. This is the hardest one for anybody who's into these kind of endurance sports. Uh, there should be one to two rest days a week and I rest, I mean, don't do nothing. Sit on TV, watch Netflix, drink beer, eat ice cream. Um, should be about one to two a week and they allow tissue healing and stimulate muscle growth as well as decrease the general inflammation you're gonna build up from doing these miles. And then there should be recovery weeks. Um, every two weeks to every once a month, there should be a week where you just significantly drop the mileage. Uh, you'd maintain that in high intensity, like if you're doing speed work on that recovery week, you still want to push to that 80% I mentioned, but the mileage is notably decreased where you'll do like a 50 mile week that week and then your recovery week, you'll drop it down to a 30 or 40 mile week, just kind of take it easy. But I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and it allows further recovery without losing those cardiovascular benefits that you've built up. And stretching. Um, a lot of people don't stretch. Uh, they should stop that. Uh, Warm-ups and cool-downs. Uh, they're highly recommended, especially a warm-up. I usually recommend not stretching before you do these long runs or biking or whatever. Um, actually, studies show that stretching before risk increases the risk of injury and decreases muscular power by elongating the muscle and taking away some of its uh, power. And if it's a stabilizer muscle, it'll put a little more stress on the joint. In fact, I usually recommend a warm up before a run. And I don't want to talk about like run light, I mean like plyometric warm up. Like if you have a common muscle that tends to be tight, do plyometric warm up activities to loosen up. Mine being the IT bands. So I can show you all my little dance. I usually do the little thing like that just to kind of loosen them up back and forth. There's weird little dances you always see runners do beforehand, including one lady on, who was on TV for a while who did a little dance. It was kind of, to music, it was kind of cute. Um, so stretching should really be after a workout. Um, and it's individualized. It depends on what your problem is. Uh, there's some common stretches, and y'all all know good stretches for hamstrings and stuff like that, but dynamic tends to work a little bit better. I, and, from my experience. Uh, static stretching, you know, the, the common lay on the ground and somebody grabs your leg and brings it up and you stretch the hamstring. That will increase the muscular length, but in my experience, dynamic stretching tends to improve that functional range of motion. So while you're running, you have increased range of motion without losing that muscular power. I love yoga for that. Uh, yoga is one of the best ways I know to really increase that muscular length because not only do you have to get in that stretched position, then you gotta hold it and not fall on your butt. That's pretty hard to do. Uh, other dynamic stretching is plyometric activities. Um, that's also a good way to get that muscular lift. And then also just psychological, don't psych yourself out. Uh, a lot of people focus on the race and they think they should hurt themselves during the training. Um, I love this little quote here, for every runner who tours the world running marathons, there are thousands who just run to hear the leaves and listen to the rain and to look to the day when it's suddenly as easy as bird in flight. Poetry. <laughs> um, I like this philosophy for one thing, if you're gonna spend most of your time training for a race, 
why drive yourself nuts by working as hard? And from our aspect, the more important thing, if you're, dry, if you're beating the heck out of yourself every run to train for a race to make somehow make the race easier, again, you're more likely to get injury, injured. Injured. Um, you're more likely to get injured just for the mere fact that you are beating the heck out of yourself. Most of your workouts should be fairly easy. Uh, and you'll quit if it ain't fun. Because I'm in my 30s, I don't have to do this. So it's one of those, if I'm not enjoying it, why do it? Uh, also, fueling is very important. Um, you think it would be, uh, wouldn't be because you could probably just eat whatever you want, but not true. Uh, in fact, it has a huge impact on how you recover from the running and how you recover from all the training and lifting and all that. If you don't give the body the right fuel, it can't fully build up muscle, it can't fully recover and fully process all the inflammation that you develop. Uh, there's a bunch of theories on how to eat for these things. Uh, high carb, you know, that whole thing where the day before a long race you eat a ton of pasta. Um, paleo, which I don't get, but a lot of people do. Uh, the ketogenic diet, where it's kind of like paleo, where you eat a lot of meat and very little carbs. Um, I love carbs, so I don't do that one. Uh, the vegan, which uh, takes a lot of work, but a lot of people have tremendous success on. So, if, uh, And then my buddy Ed's diet, Ed Melanson, he's one of the best ultra runners in the state. Uh, usually if he's in a race, he won it. Um, his is uh, bacon and beer. And that's about it. Which it's really intimidating to like, you have this like pre-measured drink that you, and you ate a real balanced oatmeal thing before and Ed's eating a bacon sandwich and drinking a beer before the race even starts. And he usually has more beer on the way. In fact, he's fairly drunk as he wins the 100 mile race, which just pisses everybody off. <laughs> Uh, but really, it's an experiment of one. I always tell people, try all these diets and see what happens. Uh, if you have a lot of success going paleo, go for it. I don't care if you do it as long as you're having success with it. Don't force it if it ain't happening. But try it out. Uh, personally, I just, I'm, I, I'm lazy. So it's one of those, I'm not going to follow these strict, strict rules. Usually I go and eat healthy, real foods partially because they just taste better, uh, don't eat too much, and mostly plants. Eat some meat, you know, whatever. If I feel like I want a steak, I eat a steak. If I want a beer, I drink a beer. If I want a lot of pasta, go for it. I, it just usually if you feel like you want it, then it's probably what your body needs anyway. Um, but again, it's finding that diet that makes the runs feel good just for the mere fact that if you don't, you're probably not giving the body the nutrients, minerals, vitamins, whatever that it needs to recover and stay healthy. Uh, and then cross training. Uh, cross training is anything that ain't the sport that you're doing. Uh, I put running there, but if you're a triathlete, get off the bike. Uh, so swimming, cycling, cross country skiing, hip training, uh, like the CrossFit thing. Um, yoga, boxing, etc. Boxing, you'd be hell, surprised at what hell of a cardio workout you can get with boxing. Uh, I do it with my kid every now and then. It's fun to watch him hit the bag and he hits it harder than I do, which is sad for me. He's five. <laughs> um, it also allows the body to recover and reduces that repetitive strain on the muscles that are being overused while you're doing your sport. Uh, when you're running, you're only using like four or five muscles over and over and over and over and over. It's good to switch it up. And even if you're using the same muscles, you're using them in a different way, which decreases that repetitive stress. That's why usually I have one of the days of the week be a cross training day. Do something else. Uh, it also strengthens, mu strengthens muscles, increases flexibility, and it's fun. Run running, even if you love running, it can get boring. So it's good to find another thing to do. Uh, and then weight training. Uh, a lot of runners don't want to do weight training because if you weigh 200 pounds of muscle or you weigh 175 of muscle, if you're going to carry that for 100 miles, it's much better to carry 175 than carry 200. So a lot of runners won't do it because they're scared of bulking up. But it's really important because if you want to go faster 
are very, very long. Strength training is kind of a requirement. Uh, it works to prevent muscular imbalances that lead to overuse injuries, and it increases the power of the musculature. So on the leg push off, you'll run faster. Quite literally, I drop the minute mile on my sprints just by introducing weight training. Uh, common strengthening, um, I'm not going to go into deep detail on how to strengthen up specific musculature, but you know, push ups, pull ups, planks, I love planks, and then uh, body weight squats. Those are kind of the basic four. If you're going to start anywhere, there's where you should start. Uh, should be low reps, high weight. And that's kind of counterintuitive because you think somebody who wants to train endurance muscle would want to do the opposite, uh, high reps, low weight. But in reality, you're already doing that. You, you're running for 20 miles. You've done that. That's what your body's used to. You want power. So as a result, you want to stick to the high, heavy, heavy stuff with like maybe like 10 reps at least. And then uh, two to three times a week for about 15 minutes. So this is not only like if you're running 100 miles, not only you got to run a boat bucket load of miles, you got to do cross training and you got to do some side weight training too. Luckily at 15 to 30 minutes, that's usually my lunch break. So it's really not that big of a deal. And you should really have your athlete reconsider running 100 miles if they're not willing to add on this also because it's a great way to get injured to not do it. Uh, running form is also important. Um, heel strike versus uh, midge foot strike. There's a whole little debate on which is better. I find actually it really doesn't matter too much. In my experience, uh, your body's built how it's built. You're going to run on your heel. You know, you're going to have the heel strike. You're going to have the toe strike. You have the midfoot strike. You're going to do whatever you do, uh, and a lot of training will decrease that. But you're still going to do it. Um, Mostly, I just try to work to ensure that the foot strike isn't, is, is close to or slightly in front of the trunk. I want it to be kind of down here, not way out in the front to hyperextend the knee or way out in the back to really just kind of throw out your back because you're trying to stay upright while your leg is way back there. Um, so posturing while you're running is important. You want the hips and the trunk to be in alignment and come down in a certain point where your toe strike is just underneath your knee, not way out here, because then you got the push off. That won't give you issues. Uh, two made a train of thought on how to train for this. Um, the first one I think is, I don't know if it's a laziness thing or just people are just like, ah, your body will get used to it. But basically one of the major schools of thought is through the repetition of major miles, the body will eventually find the easiest way to do it and will develop the most energy efficient way. So in other words, run a lot of miles, your body will eventually figure it out. I, I'm not a fan of that one because a lot of people on the road to this, I think it will happen, but a lot of people on the road to this get injured. So I'd rather train it up through plyometric drills to inf improve form. So, you know, like fast step exercises with that little ladder thing, uh, you know, um, hurdle training, rope training, that kind of thing, get them up fast, light feet as opposed to a heavy clonking steps while they're running. You want light, fast steps while you're running. And I love plyometric drills to build that up. Shoes. I always like this one. Um, I'm, th shoes are, I actually intentionally didn't put really any real information on this one. Um, mainly because we could spend another day talking about shoes. I usually tell people, don't go cheap on them and go into a, like a specialty running store. You're going to spend like a hundred bucks. If you're planning on running like a marathon, you're spending like a hundred bucks and try on a bunch of different ones and find the one that feels good. Um, usually go off the advice of somebody. That's why I suggest a running store. Usually go off the advice of somebody who knows what they're talking about. Not, not a kid at Foot Locker. Um, go, go to one of the smaller running stores around town and have yourself fitted and try them out. If they're real comfortable, that's the shoe for you. Arch support, non-arch support, high toe box, whatever. Don't Find what works. Don't find what other people suggest. Uh, muscular imbalances that I, I see a lot. Um, the one, usually before our people even tell me that what's wrong with them, I automatically tell them their butt's weak. That's usually like 99% of my friends who have gotten injured with overuse injuries. 
it's because their butt was weak. The glute max and glute media just doesn't have the strength to do what they're asking it to do. Um, also see a bucket load of tight hamstrings, mine included. Um, a little aside, I got an IT band tendonitis about three, four years ago, and my response was, okay, my glute must be weak. And my hamstrings, well, the hamstrings are probably just taking over for it. So I spent a lot of time building up my glutes and my glute med, but because I was running, by then I had run like six or seven marathons and oh, well, I'm an advanced athlete. I should go ahead and just jump into the deep end and do these big, cool exercises I found on the internet. I'm not gonna start with bridges because that's boring. I'm gonna do the crazy stuff. And as a result, I made my hamstrings stronger than hell, but my glutes were still like a, a four out of five. It was terrible. I was running multiple marathons on the weakest glutes ever. So ego has to be pushed aside and start with the basics and work your way up. It's gonna be hard to convince the athlete to do that, but it's definitely important. Uh, core, I have quite a few friends who have blown out their back because of a poor core. Uh, if you're running for that long, you got to stay upright. That core has to be strong. That's why I love planks. That's why I love lower ab work, like, you know, the hundreds and uh, the V-up thing. I love those because if you don't have that strong core to stabilize yourself, that posture I mentioned earlier is just going to fall to crap. Um, and as a result, like um, a good example is... Um, again, me, I developed a, a good bit of low back pain uh, a good while back and I pulled a couple of muscles in my lower back, mostly because of a weak core and then I developed, when I got tired, I got a really noticeable anterior pelvic tilt, uh, mostly because of tightness in my hip flexors and weakness in my core, the anterior tel pelvic tilt because I was still upright, got a lot of extension in my spine and pulled some muscles in my back. Um, just treating the low back pain won't help. I really had to build up the core strength and really work on those uh, iliopsoas muscles to make them longer, and I'm still playing with that. Um, let's see what, uh, tight hip flexors that kind of went into that, uh, and a lot of quadricep overuse. Uh, and also forward posturing, that again is the foot strike thing. You want the feet down right underneath your knee while you're running, if you don't have that good form, a lot of people end up running like this, like half bent over, and that puts a lot of strain on a lot of different muscles, including the knees. And it's, that's another way to build that pounding stress through the joints. Common injuries. Uh, when a runner is in denial about an injury, uh, Monty Python fans, a scratch, your arm's off. No, it isn't. <laughs> I know, me included, will run through pain like you wouldn't believe. Like, it's, it's an 8 out of 10, but I can still run, so it must not be broken. Uh, the most common injuries you'll see, IT band syndrome is always around somewhere. Uh, the, the most common way runners treat it is foam rolling, that, you know, which does address the symptoms, but doesn't address the problem. Uh, plantar fasciitis, again, also... Same thing, uh, usually due to tight Achilles, that kind of thing. Low back pain, I kind of talked about already, it's usually running form. Usually they, they, through various poor core as well as various muscle tightness and bad form while they're running, they get these symptoms. I have a friend of mine working through that right now. He's got some pretty severe sciatica purely because his piriformis is probably the tightest I've ever seen. It's amazing. Um, hamstring pull and muscle tear, again, that's that running through pain thing. Uh, my uncle tore the hell out of his hamstring uh, doing that. Uh, ankle sprains, uh, upper back and neck pain, that forward posture. You see a lot of runners with those rounded shoulders and they get neck pain like you wouldn't believe. And then trauma, um, struck by lightning. Um, or fall off a cliff or roll your ankle. Uh, I run a lot in Sam Houston Park. Anybody who's ever been on the trails right there, you're gonna trip and fall if you run out there. Uh, luckily, I've never actually hurt myself, but I know a couple people who have. Uh, broken collarbones, that kind of thing. So you see a lot of trauma, surprising amount of trauma that you wouldn't expect. But again, that, nothing you can do about that, except for the fact that uh, 
another friend of mine ran the uh, Beaumont Marathon, I want to say like maybe four weeks after his rotator cuff repair. In the, 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 the awkward brace nobody likes, uh, he ran the marathon just going like that. And I'm just shaking my head the whole way. It hurt worse after, I don't know why. Uh, stress fracture. Stress fracture usually, in my experience, comes from uh, not, not having adequate recovery. Those rest days, those recovery weeks, it usually comes from pushing hard and pushing hard and pushing hard and never backing off. Uh, it especially happens uh, with repeated races without re adequate recovery time. There's that whole thing where at a race, there's booths to sign up for more races. So as a result, it's very tempting to once a month run 100 miles. Like it, it really, you just see the next one and the next one and the next one and you need to, okay, I ran this big race, I need to take time off. I did the Ironman, I should probably take six months off. Um, so race recovery is usually one to two weeks to even a month depending on the intensity and the experience. And then overworking your B race and then racing your A race. A race being the big race you have on the horizon like I have a 100 mile race in February, I'm also run, planning on running a 100K to train for the 100 mile race. Uh, I could push that 100K, the B race, I could push it as hard as possible, but as a result, I will overstress a lot of muscles and not give me, myself adequate time to recover. So as a result, running the A race is a good way to get hurt by doing that. So if you're doing that kind of strategy, you have to remind your athlete to go, okay, this is your B race, you do not want to take it seriously. I, I plan to run it at a light jog. And then overtraining syndrome, which is actually a, a physiological issue that comes, it comes from an imbalance of training. Uh, this little equation right here, training equals workouts plus recovery. If you don't have enough recovery, you can get an, uh, an overtraining syndrome. Um, that's whenever you see performance just diminish like crazy for no specific reason. There's a bunch of hormonal changes, emotional changes, neurologic issues that come for it that linger for weeks to months. Uh, these people literally, their bodies are just having trouble recovering fully and it's like it's forgotten how to. Uh, so recovery is very important, especially if you notice that if you're coaching an athlete or you have an athlete come in that says, yeah, I took, uh, uh, I did a recovery week and then I tried to run my splits on the track and all of a sudden I'm like three minutes slower than I should be. What, what the hell, that, that might be, you might want to look into overtraining syndrome because that could easily be what's going on is they just pushed way too hard and their body cannot recover enough. Uh, incidentally, if this does occur, the best way of treating it is to tell them to, you know, okay, you need to stop for a while. You push too hard, you went over the limit, it's time to take a break. Here's some simple strengthening, ride a bike for a while, you don't get the race for six months. Uh, and then aging runners. And don't worry, we're close to the end. Uh, aging runners, um, the only, like I mentioned, people in their 80s run this. A, a good friend of mine who I train with on a regular basis uh, got into Boston at 82 years old. And Boston is a qualifying race. You have to run at a certain speed based on your age to get into the race. And I asked him at 80, what is the speed that you require? And he's like, well, you have to be able to run a marathon at 80. <laughs> you didn't die, you're in. <laughs> um, aging, let's face it, as we get older, the body recovers slower. So you need to add in additional rest days, additional recovery weeks, more than the younger population. You're gonna lose some speed, that's just, how it happens, don't, ex you have to reassure them, it, it just happens, you're just gonna go slower. Uh, and very close attention, much, much closer attention than the younger athletes to nutrition, cardiovascular conditioning and joint health. Um, the EKG testing that was mentioned earlier, uh, just because you run, there's that mentality that, oh, I run a lot, so my heart must be healthy. You should still, like everybody else, you should get that heart checked out because you're not, prevented. In fact, it adds a couple of extra risks by doing this kind of training. So, you know, I keep a close eye on that. And then this is just like a little, a little pet project and a little aside. Um, just because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't do this crazy stuff. 
uh, as like I said earlier, I work with a lot of people who've had strokes, head injuries, amputations, spinal cord injuries, and I've trained a couple of them for 5Ks and 10Ks, as well as got one into um, obstacle course racing. Uh, these are not my patients, but it'd be awesome if it was. Um, young man with a spinal cord injury who is uh, one of the best, I apologize for not knowing any of their names, but he's one of the best uh, extreme, I guess it's skateboarding, I don't know, I don't know what they call it, but he kicks butt at it. It's amazing what he can do in a wheelchair. Uh, I just like this picture, look at this dude, he's bowed up. Age isn't a factor, growing old is not for sissies. I want this guy's six pack, look at this thing. And then this young man, it's hard to see in the picture, I just love this picture of him, but if you notice, he's missing an arm. He is an extremely good golfer uh, with only one arm, and he's like six, seven. This young lady, again, I don't know many people's names, but this young lady um, is, I wanna say 78, 79. She's the oldest finisher for a 100 mile race. She started running in her 60s, after she retired, she got bored. So she started running, ended up running. Uh, this is Western States. She is literally the oldest person ever to finish Western States under the cutoff. I know you can't really see the clock. The cutoff is 30 hours. Uh, this clock says 29, 59, 55. <laughs> she finished just under the wire. Uh, she was run in by uh, Rob Carr and two other top finishers for the race who are encouraging her the rest of the way. And uh, there, there's a magazine, Ultra Running Magazine. She was on the cover of the magazine because of her accomplishment. Again, that's why I love this sport. Uh, this man here is in his 70s. He is the first man to ever run 100 miles uh, for Western States. It used to be a horse race. His horse got sick, so he ran it. <laughs> Um, he still runs ultras, by the way. This is just a cool picture I took, uh, cool pictures I took from the Spartan races. Uh, amputation, and he's carrying a log. I think that's not part of the obstacle. I think he's just showing off. <laughs> and I, I love this uh, Amanda Sullivan. She's an internet personality. I, I love her. Because she was in a major car wreck and has an incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, she, uh, as you can tell with the braces, she can't walk. Uh, her legs don't support as well as you'd think, and she still does Spartan races, the, the badass, not the easy ones, but the hard, hard obstacle course races. And then some stuff. <laughs> uh, any questions?